Hey everyone. Um, this is a uh, uh, a section or a chapter from Burak Knai Paz. I think I was pronouncing this person's name wrong before. I think I was saying Kni Paz. It's Knai Paz. Um. Uh, the last video I, I read of this uh author was from this same section, which is titled The uh, Permanent Revolution in the book uh, The Social and Political Thought of Leon Trotsky. Um, in the last one I read, though, uh, it was from pages 367 to 427, and the video ended up being four hours. So, um, even though this chapter is... Uh, um, less than that it's only uh looks like uh 20 pages i guess i should make it actually just one video 20 pages ain't bad um yeah i'll just fucking read the whole thing never mind never mind so it says 237 i'm reading a pdf a bit 257 will get me where I want to go. 57. Go on, you son of a gun. Patreon. 237. Oh, shit. Maybe it was 357. God damn it. There we are. Is there anything in the introduction to part three? No. Part three is just titled Permanent Revolution, quote, betrayed, end quote. All right, here we go. Chapter nine, quote, socialism in one country, end quote. The end of world revolution. Um, starts with a quote. The quote says, Marxism has always taught the workers that even their struggle for higher wages and shorter hours cannot be successful unless waged as an international struggle. And now it suddenly appears that the ideal of the socialist society may be achieved with, it, with the national forces alone. This is a mortal blow to the international. Trotsky. Footnote. It's from Trotsky, the Third International after Lenin. And the footnote says, The present and next chapter deal with the period of 1924 to 1940 and take as their sources Trotsky's writings during these 16 years. Works of a purely polemical character of which Trotsky produced an abundance during this period and which are of no theoretical interest today have been more or less ignored. Largely ignored, too, are his numerous writings devoted to, quote, setting the record straight, end quote. That is, refuting Stalin's, quote, falsifications, end quote, about past and present. The author feels justified in ignoring such writings since this study is not concerned with personal controversies, but with fundamental differences over the main issues of the period. Some mention of such writings, however, occurs in the notes primarily in order to provide bibliographical information. End footnote. Oh. Read the opening quote, read the footnote to that quote. Now we can read the text. The argument as to whether revolution in Germany in particular, but elsewhere as well in Europe, failed in the years after World War I because of miscalculation and missed opportunities, or whether the failure resulted from objective conditions is as old as the events themselves of those years. Trotsky, as we have seen, attributed the failure to instrumental factors chiefly. Even in May 1924, Trotsky declared unequivocally, quote, the causes for, bracket, the German failure, end bracket, lie wholly in tactics and not in objective conditions. We have here a truly classic example of a revolutionary situation allowed to slip by, end quote. Yet in the same year, and only a month later, 
he was delivering a speech in which, in spite of himself, Trotsky made out a good case for the opposite view. True, in a section of the speech devoted specifically to the German events of 1923, Trotsky repeated the view that success could have been achieved were it not for tactical errors. But the main body of the speech dwelt on the objective reasons why capitalism in the West was proving so resilient and managing to survive in spite of all predictions to the contrary. Taking as his example the case of England in particular, Trotsky argued that the source of the strength of capitalism in such a, quote, advanced, end quote, country was the long period it had had to develop in an, quote, organic evolutionary, end quote, way, thus avoiding sudden jolts and disruptions in the social fabric and allowing for continuous adaptations of political to social and economic forms. New social antagonisms were always arising, but the system as a whole was resourceful and flexible enough to adjust itself to the emergence of, a, of new political forces. Thus, the growth of the proletariat was accompanied by the proletariat's absorption into, rather than exclusion from, the cultural and political framework of society. The result, on the one hand, was changed by way of piecemeal and pragmatic reform, and, on the other, a ubiquitous, quote, conservatism, end quote, which impregnated all segments of society, including the working class. The latter evolved traditions and organizations which, though ostensibly at odds with the, quote, ruling classes, end quote, functioned in accordance with the ruling class's principles and rules. Thus did advanced capitalism succeed in disarming all of advanced capitalism's potential adversaries by seducing and overpowering them with its embrace. Trotsky naturally hastened to add that all this was a temporary phenomenon, the effect of which was merely to postpone the day of reckoning. But the more Trotsky and others appended this reassurance, the more it seemed to assume the character of ritual lip service. True, as subsequent years would affirm, Though others were beginning to lose hope, Trotsky never did so. But having made out a convincing case for the, quote, staying power, end quote, of capitalism, he avoided asking himself whether this was not a situation which could persist, if not indefinitely, then for so long a period as to make the whole question of a world revolution irrelevant in any case. Clearly the Russian example was remote from European reality and therefore non-exportable, except perhaps as a somewhat artificial product having no indigenous roots in the West. The creation of a, quote, Eastern Front, end quote, against the West was, of course, a reasonable alternative strategy. But what assurance was there that a backward, impoverished, and isolated East, even if ruled over by socialist governments, could confront the full might of the capitalist West. Was it not possible, therefore, that the kind of revolution which had transpired in Russia, being peculiar to that kind of society, was essentially a, quote, local affair, end quote, albeit with serious repercussions on international relations, but with no permanent impact on the internal character of a difference and older social on a character of a different and older social system. If so, there was a chasm between West and East, and the history of each had to follow its own prerogatives. Section 1. Quote, Socialism in one country, end quote. Pro and con. Numerous factors made the period from 1924 onwards a propitious one for the introduction of a doctrine such as, quote, socialism in one country, end quote. Without weighing the relative influence of each, it is the general climate which is important. We may note some of these. The death of Lenin, which both necessitated and made possible new initiatives, the revolutionary failures in Europe capped by the fiasco of 1923 in Germany, the general mood of the country, tired of, quote, revolutionary sacrifices, end quote, and uncertainties, 
eager for concrete benefits and stability, the growing necessity of attacking the problems of the economy directly and fundamentally, and not only through stopgap measures, the impatience of the growing party and state apparatus, and the need for a new national ideological framework within which the objectives and tasks of Reconstruction could be accommodated and coordinated. There's a footnote that I missed. Trotsky pointed out, see the Third International after Lenin, pages 43 to 4, that the first to raise the idea of socialism in a single country had been the German right-wing social democrat G. Folmar in the article Der Eiselierte Sozialistische Staat, published in the Jahrbuch für Sozialwissenschaft and Sozialpolitik in 1879. But Folmar, according to Trotsky, made the projected, quote, isolated socialist state, end quote, in this case Germany, dependent on, quote, lively economic relations with world capitalist economy, end quote. In the course of time, Fulmar believed the socialist state would triumph peacefully over capitalism as a result of the socialist state's more efficient economic system, thus making actual revolutions in other countries unnecessary. Trotsky did not accept Fulmar's thesis, but Trotsky considered Fulmar's thesis at least more convincing than that of Stalin's doctrine of, quote, socialism in one country, end quote, which Trotsky argued assumed that socialism could be built in an isolated, backward, non-industrialized country without economic ties with Europe. End footnote. To all this one must append, of course, the constant factor of the struggle for the succession to Lenin, and in particular, Stalin's already evident determination to create a monopoly of power for himself. In the event, however, Stalin originally does not seem to have conceived of the idea of, quote, socialism in one country, end quote, as a doctrine aimed at exploiting all of these factors, and it was only later that its wider usefulness became apparent to him. At the outset, it appeared to be yet another ideological tactic in the ongoing campaign to discredit the views and status of Trotsky a campaign which had begun in 1923 and which by the time of Lenin's death had already proven partly effective. Footnote. For a succinct account of the Stalin-Trotsky controversy, see H. Brahms' La Révolution Permanente de Trotsky et la Socialisme dans un seul pays de Staline. I don't know if I'm saying that right. In Cahier du monde russe, excuse russe et soviétique. I don't know. Uh, in what follows, only the ideas and arguments of Stalin and Trotsky are juxtaposed, and no attempt is made to deal with the history of the actual political struggle between the two men, nor with Stalin's road to power in general. This intricate, quote, chapter, end quote, in the history of the Soviet Union has been amply documented and extensively written about. See in particular Cars, The Interregnum, 1923-1924, to Part 3, and Socialism in One Country, 2, Part 3, as well as Shapiro, The Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Chapters 15-22, to Deutscher's second volume of the Trotsky biography, The Prophet Unarmed, is largely devoted to this subject. See also Deutscher's Stalin, A Political Biography, published in 1961, chapter 7 and 8. Nor is any attempt made to deal with the vast anti-Trotsky diatribes, which now began to appear in the Soviet Union, and which were written by such figures as Kamenev, Zinoviev, Bukharin, and, of course, Stalin, for a compilation of such material, including the contributions from above. See Zalenism... I don't fucking know. Some book, some <laughs> uh, Russian book. Where am I? 
Stalin first praised the excuse me, first raised the idea in an article he wrote in December 1924, but was then presented in a somewhat moderate form. The gist of it was that since in Russia the dictatorship of the proletariat had been established through an alliance between workers and peasants, a wide enough social basis existed for organizing a socialist economy without waiting for revolutions to break out elsewhere. Trotsky, in Stalin's view, had overestimated the dependence of Russia upon outside aid by underestimating the importance of peasant support. Therefore, his theory of permanent revolution was, quote, a variant of Menshevism, end quote, since, like Menshevism, the theory, Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution was disdainful to, to the, of the possibilities of socialism in Russia. Missed a footnote here. The article was originally called, this is the article um, by uh, Stalin. Stalin. Stalin article. First rate, where he first raised the idea of socialism in one country. Um, it says, the article was originally called October and Comrade Trotsky's Theory of Permanent Revolution and published in the 20th of December 1924 issue of Pravda in his Vestia. In January 1925, it was republished, this time under the title, quote, The October Revolution and the Tactics of the Russian Communists. The English version of this article is in Stalin Problems of Leninism. As late as April 1924, Stalin and his Foundations of Leninism, a series of lectures delivered at Zverdlov University, argued that socialism in a single country was impossible and that revolutions in other countries were an essential precondition for the establishment of socialism in Russia. End footnote. Nevertheless, Stalin was careful to add that although, quote, socialism in one country, end quote, was possible in the conditions of Russia, the, quote, complete victory of socialism, end quote, still depended on revolutions in other countries. Thus, world revolution, Stalin agreed, remained an essential objective. The article, and the idea it contained, did not at first arouse any particular attention. Only gradually did the subject enter into party ideological discussions. Its ascendance there was less due to its usefulness as a weapon against Trotsky than to the fact that it seemed to offer some alternative hope to growing, the growing despair at the prospects of a European revolution. If socialism could be established in one country, even without, quote, complete victory, end quote, then the Soviet Union need not feel herself impotent in the face of revolutionary failures in Europe. The Soviet Union could proceed with her objectives in a spirit of optimism, however guarded, and with the sense that she was implementing some, at least of the original aims of the revolution. All was not lost, after all. On the contrary, the more the Soviet Union reconstructed herself along socialist lines, the greater impetus this would give in the long run to socialist movements in the West, quote, socialism in one country, end quote, was becoming moreover a popular slogan with its appeal to national sentiments and to the independent potentialities of Russia. Footnote, see Carr, Socialism in One Country, 2, pages 59 to 61. Sensing this climate, Stalin at the beginning of 1926 decided to turn what was originally no more than a modest idea into a major doctrine. In January of that year, he published the essay On the Problems of Leninism, and here Stalin formulated what was to become the official version of, quote, socialism in one country. Footnote. For the English version, see Stalin, Problems of Leninism, pages 149 to 212. It may be briefly, end footnote, it may be briefly summarized as follows. World revolution is and will always remain a prime objective of Soviet policy. But the problems facing the Soviet Union at this time were more of an internal than an external nature. 
If world revolution was not forthcoming for the time being and if nothing was done to deal with internal problems, the Soviet Union would inevitably collapse. Fortunately, the reconstruction of the economy did not depend on the outside world. Russia had sufficient internal resources, both human and material, to be self-reliant. Moreover, these resources were large enough not only to affect reforms, but to create a, quote, full, end quote, socialist society. It was all a matter of, quote, resolving the contradictions between the proletariat and the peasantry with the aid of the internal forces of our country, dot, 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 with the sympathy and support of the proletariat of other countries, but without the preliminary victory of the proletarian revolution in other countries, end quote. Stalin, Problems of Leninism. The psychological element was uppermost in Stalin's argument. Quote, Without such a possibility, bracket, of the victory of socialism in one country, end bracket, building socialism is building without prospects, building without being sure that socialism will be completely built. It is no use engaging in building socialism without being convinced that we can build socialism completely, without being convinced that the technical backwardness of our country is not an insuperable obstacle to the complete construction of a fully socialist society. To deny such a possibility is to show a lack of faith in the cause of building socialism, to abandon Leninism, end quote. Stalin Problems of Leninism. Stalin made a distinction between this, quote, victory of socialism in one country, end quote, and, quote, the complete final victory of socialism in one country, end quote. The, the quote, complete final victory of socialism in one country, end quote, Stalin defined as the ultimate elimination of the threat of outside intervention. And this, Stalin admitted, was dependent on revolutions in other countries. But the possibility of building a socialist society itself was not thereby affected. In the long run, it is true, the Soviet Union would have to hope for the direct support of the European proletariat. In the meantime, however, socialism was a task which the Soviet people alone could undertake. Stalin's essay hardly delved into the full complexities of the doctrine he was proposing. The economic and social implications of it were only perfunctorily discussed and arguments against it were dismissed as merely symptoms of, quote, skepticism, end quote, and, quote, lack of faith, end quote. It was as if socialism had been reduced to a matter of a proper psychological frame of mind. But there was a certain con common sense in Stalin's position. After all, Reality had to be faced, and reality quite clearly revealed two incontrovertible facts. World revolution was at best an uncertain prospect, and the Soviet Union was still in dire economic straits. To continue linking these two facts was to sink deeper into the impasse of a vicious circle. What was needed, Stalin believed, was a positive, alternative program emphasizing the possibilities of self-reliance. The doctrine of, quote, socialism in one country, end quote, seemed to offer such a program. Whether it would in fact lead to socialism appeared to matter less than the immediate prospects it raised of some progress, and since it gave at least of, quote, doing something, end quote. Finally, Stalin's position was of course strengthened by the fact that others seemed unable to offer or to agree upon any other realistic way out of the impasse. Tactically, Stalin had won a victory by defining his doctrine as the direct antithesis of Trotsky's, quote, permanent revolution, end quote. The latter was thus made to appear both defeatist and adventuristic, defeatist about the potentialities of the Soviet Union and adventuristic in per the theory of permanent revolution's insistence on revolutions abroad. This is, of course, a gross misrepresentation of the views Trotsky was, in fact, advocating at the time. It was Trotsky, after all, 
who is arguing for more fundamental economic forms, for a more rapid rate of industrialization, for a generally more positive approach to internal possibilities, all measures which Stalin himself was eventually to adopt as part of the drive for socialism in one country. And although Trotsky was certainly more prepared to encourage revolution in Europe, Trotsky did not at any time propose reckless confrontations with the might of the capitalist world. But Stalin had grasped the initiative by counterposing his ideas to those of Trotsky, and Trotsky found himself more and more identified, however unfairly, with a negative, pessimistic, and unrealistic position. At first, Trotsky appeared to want to avoid a confrontation on Stalin's terms. Already in a letter of January 1925, sensing the danger of being, quote, labeled, end quote, he had written the attack on his theory of permanent revolution, excuse me, he had written that the attack on his theory of permanent revolution was irrelevant since the theory of permanent revolution belonged to the past and had nothing to do with present issues. Footnote. Trotsky would make a similar statement at the 15th Party Congress in 1926, again trying to avoid a confrontation on Stalin's terms. And footnote. Ultimately, however, the confrontation proved unavoidable. The theory of permanent revolution did become the antithesis of the, quote, theory of socialism in one country, end quote. And Trotsky himself came to accept the complete incompatibility of the two. Quote, the theory of socialism in one country, end quote, Trotsky would write in 1929, quote, is the only theory that consistently and to the very end is opposed to the theory of the permanent revolution, end quote. For the truth of the matter was that although Stalin had intentionally exaggerated the antithesis and had so outmaneuvered Trotsky that the latter was himself forced into exaggerating it, the differences between the two theories, socialism in one country and permanent revolution, were real and substantial. It was, of course, patently incorrect to make the extreme claim, as Stalin had done, that while Stalin proposed to reconstruct the home front, Trotsky was prepared to sacrifice the home front to external objectives, but neither would it be correct to reduce the differences to the fact merely that while Stalin wanted to concentrate on internal problems, Trotsky urged the simultaneous pursuit of internal and external goals. There was some truth in this on the surface, but it was only a partial expression of more profound differences of outlook and orientation. For Trotsky, the concept of, quote, national socialism, end quote, which is what he believed, quote, socialism in one country, end quote, is what he believed socialism in one country to amount to, was a contradiction in terms. The idea that one country and a backward country at that, could by itself create a socialist society that negated everything that he had always believed in. Naturally, his whole international orientation rebelled against the idea, but so did his whole conception of socialism. It is on the basis of both the one and the other, therefore, that in innumerable writings, which occupied him to the end of his life, he set out to refute the theory of socialism in one country. Enough has been said in the course of this study about Trotsky's views on the relationship, both before and after 1917, between Russia and Europe as to make any further comment on this subject merely superfluous. We need only note here that the peculiarity which he attributed to this relationship, first in the form of the... Excuse me one second... We need only note here that the peculiarity which he attributed to this relationship, first in the form of the impact of the advanced West on a backward society, then in the form of the impact of a revolution in that society on the West, was the historical basis for his condemnation of a doctrine which, in Trotsky's view, sought artificially to rend asunder what history had forever joined. Nor is it necessary to refer again to a concomitant view of his, the international character of modern revolutions, which also underlay his rejection of socialism in one country, 
Trotsky believed, as we have seen, that no 20th century revolution could be restricted to local or national proportions, if only because of the nature of the world economy. Finally, we may similarly only mention in passing the universalist aspects of his thought which equally dictated his opposition to Stalin's thesis. He inherited from Marx the view that capitalism was a universalizing force, which, however, unable to break through national boundaries, was destined to re be replaced by socialism, a system literally called forth by the universality of the modern age. With these general tenets in mind, they are really intrinsically related and parts of a single credo. We may concentrate on what follows on Trotsky's more specific arguments against the doctrine of socialism in one country. For the sake of clarity as well as brevity, these may be summarized under three headings. A. The dependence of the Soviet economy upon the world economy. B. The socioeconomic preconditions for the building of socialism and see the effect of the doctrine on the pursuit of world revolution. Footnote. As this chop chapter concentrates on the international implications of Stalin's doctrine of socialism in one country, those of Trotsky's arguments which deal with the implications of the doctrine for the character of Soviet society itself have been relegated to the next chapter. And that chapter is on um, the channel already. So, A. The Dependence of the Soviet Economy Upon the World Economy The greatest danger of Stalin's policy of, quote, socialism in one country, end quote, was, according to Trotsky, the isolation of the Soviet Union which it entailed. If the Soviet Union were to be isolated, that is, not just by remaining the only country in which a revolution had triumphed, but also by being cut off economically from the capitalist world, not even a start could be made on the actual reconstruction of the economy. For even the most rudimentary implementation of Stalin's proposals was dependent on foreign trade, imports, capital, know-how, and so on, and thus ironically, quote, socialism in one country, end quote, accentuated reliance on others. The era of purely national economies, Trotsky believed, had long ended. No country could plan and run its economy without large-scale foreign trade, and without in some measure being dependent on international sources of capital. Thus the interdependence, in good times as well as bad, of individual economies. In the case of Russia, Trotsky argued that the problem went beyond this normal state of relations. It was a matter not so much of interdependence as one-sided dependence. Being poor, undeveloped, and incapable of producing from her own resources, those means and implements necessary for development, Russia had to rely on imports. Still very much as in Tsarist times, capital and goods had to be paid for by agricultural produce. This internal production always stood in danger of being governed by the size of exports needed. The internal market by the world market, internal policy by external demands. Nevertheless, economic ties with the West were unavoidable if the Soviet economy was to be developed. Gradually, though never completely, Russia's, posi Russia's position vis-a-vis -vis the West could be improved. Stalin's alternative according to Trotsky, because it was based on unrealizable internal potentialities, would not only isolate the Soviet Union but bring about the complete subordination of the Soviet Union's economy to that of the capitalist world. There is no prospect whatever, in Trotsky's view, that the economy on its own resources could withstand the powerful pressures from the West. The solution to internal economic problems, therefore, lay in the international arena, in the first instance through economic relations with the West. This admittedly would only suffice to encourage initial economic growth, but not to create a socialist economy. That is why, according to Trotsky, world revolution ultimately was the only final solution to the problem of socialism in a backward society. 
Footnote. For various formulations of this argument by Trotsky, see in particular the following. The Real Situation in Russia, pages 83 to 87. The Draft Program of the Communist International, A Criticism of Fundamentals in Trotsky, the Third International after Lenin, pages 1 to 230. Especially pages 43 to 51. The Russian original of the Draft Program, A Criticism of Fundamentals, written in June 1928, is in the Trotsky Archives, T31157. All subsequent references are to the above English edition. The Third International after Lenin was published as Volume 1 of a projected multi-volume selected works of Leon Trotsky under the editorship of Max Schachtman. However, only this and one other volume, The Stalin School of Falsification, appeared. End footnote. B. The Socioeconomic Preconditions for the Building of Socialism For Trotsky, as for Marx, a socialist society was a society of plenty, not of want. Socialist society was a society which had solved all the main problems of economic production and distribution, not one which had merely, quote, equalized scarcity, end quote. But this presupposed a number of developments, advanced technology, and mechanization, optimal accessibility to, and exploitation of, natural resources, a unified international economy as opposed to one consisting of hostile, competitive national units, and a cultural milieu encouraging education, science, and continuous research. It is because of the, imp the impetus which it gave to these and related developments that Marx saw capitalism as a progressive force and the precursor of socialism. Trotsky took all this for granted and consequently considered implicitly absurd the notion that a backward society, which far from solving problems of economic want, was still in their grip, could, quote, leap, end quote, into a socialist millennium. This was to Trotsky merely utopian rhetoric, in itself a function of what he called, quote, national messianism, end quote. To presume that the vast natural riches of Russia were sufficient to eliminate poverty and backwardness was to presume that the problem was a purely quantitative one. In fact, it was here that economics and qualitative social and cultural development were most intertwined. To extract natural resources required know-how. Their proper utilization was a matter of overall social arrangements, and the conditions of plenty which such resources could provide were therefore dependent on work habits, education, and general customs of life. To build socialism on a low technical and cultural basis was to bring forth a situation in which everyone simply shared equally in poverty. Once again, therefore, the Soviet Union was dependent on the West, through which, it, which alone it could assimilate the socioeconomic preconditions for socialism, and backward societies in general could make the leap to socialism only within the framework of a world socialist development. Footnote. This argument is, of course, a recurrent theme in all of Trotsky's work, but for a concise statement of it in relation to socialism in one country, See Trotsky's The Revolution Betrayed. This work, among the most important of Trotsky's writings while in exile, was never published in Russian and will be referred to in this English translation by Max Eastman, the Russian version under the title something something, is in the archives T394653, the work is discussed in detail in the next chapter which again is already on here on the YouTube channel. End footnote. New section. Or, or new, uh, the effect of socialism in one country on the pursuit of world revolution. Or C, C the effect of socialism in one country on the pursuit of world revolution.
Since Stalin had declared that the only danger to socialism in the Soviet Union was foreign intervention, it followed in Trotsky's view that everything would have to be done to placate the enemies of the country. And this was in keeping with the general philosophy of isolation and self-centeredness. Socialism in one country meant not only reneging on world revolution, but discouraging world revolution everywhere in order not to provoke the West. Turning in upon itself, the Soviet Union would deny revolutionary intentions abroad and would redefine its ties with the workers' movement in Europe. The effect on the common turn would be catastrophic. It would become merely an instrument of Soviet interests, and a pacifist one at that, a, quote, subsidiary, end quote, and, quote, decorative, end quote, institution devoted primarily to a maintenance of the status quo in Europe. Quote, the task of the parties in the common turn assumes, therefore, an auxiliary character. Their mission is to protect the USSR from intervention and not to fight for the conquest of power. Bracket, the common turns, end bracket, main role, the role of an instrument of world revolution, is then inevitably relegated to the background, and this dot dot dot, flows from the internal logic of the new theoretical position, dot, 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 end quote. Trotsky. From the draft program of the Communist International, A Criticism of Fundamentals, pages 61 and 62. End footnote. The conclusion, therefore, drew... The conclusion Trotsky therefore drew from these considerations was that, quote, socialism in one country, end quote, being fundamentally incompatible with world revolution, would not only not encourage progressive forces in Europe and elsewhere, but would, albeit unwittingly, serve the interests of the forces of reaction. Footnote. In this connection, see also Trotsky's article of July 1928, written in the form of a letter, Quote, what now, end quote, in the Third International after Lenin. Okay, we'll take a break. Okay. 